This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and I'm with former Olympian, former WWE superstar. He's wrestled all over the world, a true legend, coming back for his part two interview. Mr. Ken Patira, how are you doing today, sir? Very good, Devin. Yourself? I'm doing excellent. I just came from the gym, did a good leg workout. Nothing compared to what you used to lift, though. <laughs> yeah, but you're doing uh, mixed martial arts, right? Yeah, I also do that type of training as well, yeah. Yeah, so you so, you don't want to get all bulked up on all that those barbells and dumbbells. Well, speaking of bulked up, there were some questions last time. Uh, people wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about your diet back when you were training. Well, um, that was my favorite beer because they didn't have Miller Lite uh, beer at the time. Uh, Miller Lite beer didn't come out until uh, the mid 70s. So I had a drink Olympia beer from Tumwater, Washington, and uh, and uh, Miller Hyde Light, you know, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. That's a lot better than this broccoli protein shake that I. Oh had. my God! <laughs> Get that away from me. <laughs> No, but I, you know, barbell plates and T-bone steaks. And I used to throw a chocolate cake in there once in a while. Uh, I think I'm stealing uh, Superstar Billy Graham's line. People would ask him, well, Billy, what, what's your diet like? Barbell plates and T-bone steaks. And I am sweeter than a chocolate cake. <laughs> but anyway, um what did I eat back then? You know what I, you know, I was a super heavyweight. I weighed 310 pounds to as much as 350 pounds back in those days. And so uh, we didn't have creatine and all that stuff. But then when I was through wrestling, I had no idea. A pound of sirloin steak had five to eight grams of creatine in it just naturally. And so, uh, like, I, I, I remember uh, uh, Lou, Ferrigno, uh, Lou Ferrigno and uh, uh, the Austrian oak, Arnold Schwarzenegger. They said, if you want to be strong, eat beef. If you want to look good, eat chicken and fish. So that kind of, you know, tells the story right there. What were your thoughts on milk? Because we hear some bodybuilders and powerlifters say stay away from it and others swear by it. Yeah, I love milk. I grew up on milk. When I was a kid, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a quart of milk. My parents had, the, that was when the, the old time milk man would actually bring 12 quarts of uh, milk up to the front porch. You know, and uh, it was a case of 12, and then there was another little case of six. So he'd bring a case of 12 and a case of six. Two days later, uh, that was every fourth day, we still had to go up to the convenience store and get 12 quarts. And that's because uh, uh, my two brothers, one younger, one older, and myself, we, we drank a couple quarts of uh, milk a day. So, I mean, we, we would run out after three days. But, uh, yeah, I, I love milk. I never found anything wrong with milk. I heard Ric Flair say in his book that when he lived with you, you were eating Whoppers very often. And for him, it turned to fat. You, it turned to muscle. Was yeah. that part of your diet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, back in the day, there was an old commercial on TV. It takes two hands to handle a Whopper. Well, shit, I'd eat three or four of those damn things every day. And uh, along with, you know, pizza, spaghetti, and meatballs. Flair's uh, favorite food was spaghetti and meatballs. He just said uh, he, he couldn't get enough. And as far as Ric Flair, you were telling us off camera that he actually saw the last interview that you did with me where you were talking about living with him. Uh, could you tell us about that? 
Yeah, about a week. Uh, yeah, about a week after uh, I talked to you on this uh, setup here, uh, I get a phone call, and uh, it's a, a mutual friend of Rick of mine. His name's Kenny Rockler, and he lives in St. Paul, where I live, and uh, he just lives maybe ten minutes from me. And so he calls me. He says, "Ken, did, did you get uh, Rick's a message?" I said, no, why? He's been trying to get a hold of you for two weeks. I says, well, shit, I don't answer that damn phone every day, you know. <laughs> I don't use the phone that often. I hate it. I hate phones. And, uh, but, uh, so finally he said, call Rick. He really wants to talk to you. So then I returned his call and got a hold of his wife. And she got a hold of him. So finally, after I think it was about three weeks, we wound up talking. And the first thing he brings up is uh, uh, me being on your show. He said, God damn. He said, that's fantastic. It's great. Yeah. And as far as Ric Flair, I mean, you live with him. He was known for getting a lot of girls he claims 10,000. Do you think that's possible uh, from your experience around him that he could have reached numbers that high? And and how were your skills with the ladies back in those days? Boy, you know how to shoot me down, don't you? Make me feel I'm ready to cry. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll tell you, if Wilt the Stilt Chamberlain did 30,000 women, as he claims, he would have had a fuck three and a half women every day for his entire lifetime. That's from the day he was born. So talking about bullshit. So I would say that Rick was maybe 10,000 might be a little low, tell you the truth. I saw Rick, oh, Jesus. We'd be in a parking lot at a 7-Eleven store and be getting a pipe job from some dolly. And uh, just, you know, Rick is real personable and uh, real outgoing. And he has that type of personality. It's like a magnet. It just brought, uh, draws people in, uh, st especially women. And uh, so uh, I'd say Rick probably numbered, uh, yeah, 10,000, he says. Yeah, I, I, I'd say 12,000 plus. And I guess with you, you were famous from the Olympics. You were buddies with Rick, and you were also famous from pro wrestling. I don't know if you had that type of personality, but did you uh, get your fair share back in those days as well? Yeah, I well, I, as I tell people, you know, we – We'd uh, show up at the arena, you know, we'd drive wherever we were going. Didn't matter, Milwaukee, Chicago, Boston, New York, Miami, whatever. You show up, and you know there's going to be girls out there, you know, probably 20 to 30. And you just take your pick. You know, there's no, you know, everybody knew what the hell was going on. Everybody knew the score. And uh, I'll tell you about one little town up in the mountains of North uh, North Carolina is called Asheville. And uh, it's not a little town anymore. It's a pretty big town now. But uh, the Vanderbilts built this huge castle up there. And so it was a real uh, tourist uh, attraction place. And we wrestled up there every Sunday. Well, we had a turnover of girls that was unbelievable. We had a lot of the same every week, but because of that castle was such a, a tourist attraction, there was girls everywhere. And uh, so uh, it wasn't unusual to uh, to do two, three, sometimes four girls in an afternoon. Yeah, that that's the truth. That was, well, that was my limit. I mean, Paul Jones and Ric Flair and some of those guys, shit, who knows, five, six, seven. 
uh, wouldn't be unusual. <laughs> that was part of the fun of being a wrestler in those days because I don't think it's like that anymore, unfortunately. Well, not with this COVID. Yeah. No. But uh, yeah, I, it, it was unbelievable. You know, we were like the only act in town. Uh, like in Charlotte, uh, now they have pro football, pro uh, uh, basketball. I think they have a junior league type of baseball and hockey down there. So uh, all the sports are covered. But when we were down in Charlotte, uh, Crockett Promotions, that was the old NWA, we were the only uh, game in town. And, uh, I mean, we sold out everywhere in the mid-Atlantic area. That'd be South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and uh, uh, parts of uh, North Tennessee, North Northeast Tennessee. And, uh, yeah, we, we had it all to ourselves. We were making uh, bucket, bucket loads of money at the time. And uh, that was back when... Uh, uh, the promoter, well, not the promoter, but the booker, George Scott, he had a custom-built home, 3,400 square feet. He paid $56,000 for it. This thing was a show place, just gorgeous. And uh, I left there a year and a half after he had that thing built. I come up to the WWF. I was up here for a year. I went back, to, no, a year and a half, I think it was. I went back to North Carolina, and my wife was real good friends with George and his wife. So my wife says, hey, you want to buy uh, George's house? I said, yeah, but we can't afford that place. He said he'd sell it to, to us for 56000 That's what he paid to build it. I said, really? And uh, he said, Really? So I, I went over to George George's place, and I talked to him about it. He said, yeah. He said, uh, give me 3000 down, and then we'll uh, go to the bank and get a loan, and it'll be yours. So I, I'm not going to pass that up. <laughs> no, that's a pretty good deal. As far as Mark Henry – what is your opinion of him as a, as a weightlifter and a wrestler? And, and who do you think is stronger between the two of you uh, for powerlifting? Oh, well, I don't know. You know, uh, Mark was trained by a guy by the name of Terry Todd. Do you remember Terry Todd? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he passed away. And I think his wife, Jan, also passed away. But they were uh, uh, coaching uh, uh, Henry. And uh, so they, uh, uh, they, they what, what's Henry, Henry's first name again? Mark. Yeah, Mark. They said, uh, 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 Terry calls me one day. And uh, this is after he did that tour with Andre the Giant. He went around the whole WWF and some other towns with Andre the Giant, wrote an article for Sports Illustrated. And so Terry calls me and tells me about this thing that's going to be coming out in uh, uh, Sports Illustrated. I said, well, very good. He said, by the way, I have a guy that uh, Jan and I, or training. Well, I said, yeah. And he, he says, his name's Mark Henry. He's just a big mountain of a man. And uh, he's going to break all your records. I says, well, okay, that's fine. Yeah. And I said, what does he want to do after he breaks all my records? Well, he wants to go to the Olympic Games and win the gold medal. I said, well, you know, that's easier said than done, you know. And oh yeah, but the, this is the real deal. Mark Henry's the real deal, and uh, Jan and I were throwing all our support behind him. And I says, "Well, good luck." And next thing I know, Mark Henry doesn't break any of my records, and uh, he doesn't win any medals. 
Like I say, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. Next thing I know, he's in the WWF as the world's strongest man. I said, well, how can he be the world's strongest man when he didn't break any of my records? <laughs> but that's the magic of Vince McMahon and the WWF. <laughs> yeah, and he had a huge contract, too. I think it was a 10-year deal for a million dollars a year. Yeah, something like that. It was huge. Yeah, I said, God, it took me a 16 to 18 year career to make uh, $2 million. Of course, those were different days, you know. <clears throat> Gas was only 40 cents a gallon. You buy a, buy a brand new luxury automobile for 6500 You buy a six, <laughs> excuse me. You can buy a six seven hundred thousand dollar house for fifty six thousand, and because that the house I bought from George, I sold it to Jimmy Garvin, and Jimmy Garvin wound up selling it for six or seven hundred thousand just a couple years after that. Yeah, Billy Graham had uh, a skin cancer operation on his nose yesterday. And he, had go, he has a GoFundMe going, and some people uh, were making comments like, oh, all the millions he made, and and now <laughs> he's asking fans. But the pay wasn't that great in the 70s. I, I think a main event, Madison Square Garden, was under 10000 wasn't it? Under <clears> – <throat> if it wasn't sold out, it was under 3000 My biggest payday in the – well, I – Every time I was the main event in the garden, which was about eight or nine, ten times, I had uh, all of them were sold out except one. So my base salary on all the ones that were sold out was thirty five hundred. And the one, uh, uh, the third time I wrestled Bruno in the garden, we set the all time attendance record. To this day, it still stands. And I'll tell you why. The felt forum down below uh, was only supposed to seat like 3,500 people or 4,000. And the garden upstairs was 19,200 and something. Anyway, when the fire marshal wasn't looking, they put in 22,096 people upstairs in the garden. And downstairs, they put 4,500 in. So it was almost 27,000 people. And the Knicks uh, attendance, uh, they, well, they didn't even come close. It's like 22, 23,000 people. Yeah. And what was your payoff on that night for that all-time record? They gave me an extra 350 bucks. So I made $3,850. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now nowadays that'd be a twenty five thousand dollar payout or thirty five thousand. Yeah. Nowadays they don't even have to draw. They they get the same pay whether there's nobody in the building or whether it's full. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I saw that. I I turned on the WWF. Uh, I think it was Monday or Tuesday night. I'm looking. I I don't watch it very often. I really don't know what the hell's going on. I'm looking, I said, God, there's no fans in there. Yeah, they had a bunch of wrestlers and a bunch of people from the office, I guess, uh, standing around hooting and hollering, and uh, that was it. But I, from my understanding, nobody's pay got canceled. Uh, Is that true? They, they have you know? huge, huge TV deals worth hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So they're being funded mainly by TV revenue these days. Yeah. Well, that's like all the other pro sports, you know, whether uh, football, basketball, baseball, hockey. The, 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 all those contracts are guaranteed. But, you know, to the uh, uh, league and to the teams, but a player's salary in the NFL is not guaranteed. One of those players sign a $50 million contract, they better get it in writing that it's guaranteed. 
otherwise they get injured that that's it now you mentioned your feud with bruno what was it like being in the ring with him and did you get along with him outside the ring yeah 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 uh bruno didn't uh, get out mix it up with the crowd too much you know and there are a couple bars uh uh, up by Times Square, probably about, was that, 10, 12 miles north of Madison Square Garden. That's where, you know, all the wrestlers would hang out and all the girls after the wrestling show would come up and hang out. But I never saw Bruno hang out uh, in, in that uh, environment. He, he was, you know, he had been in uh, business a lot longer and he was a champion and whatnot, you know. So I, I don't know where he uh, would go, but I'm sure he had pl more than a few places to go. <laughs> yeah, he liked to chase the skirts too, you know. I'm surprised to hear that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Were you surprised when he passed away because he was still in top shape and he allegedly never took any steroids or anything like that? Yeah, no, he he didn't take any drugs. I I, I can verify that. I trust that when, when he tells me that he never took any drugs, well, he bench pressed 575. Man, his chest was so enormous and his short arms you know, he only had to move it four or five inches uh, on a bench press. So when he told me his best bench press was 575 pounds, that should, that's more than believable. Uh, without steroids or anything like that, without a bench shirt. You know, nowadays everybody uh, uses those bench shirts. I, 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 I never tried one on. A friend of mine, uh, when I had my health club in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, I had a bunch of weightlifters and you know power lifters in there. He said, Cam, why don't you put one of these power shirts on, you know, see how much you can bench press. I said, well, I wouldn't do any good. I just had my shoulder replaced for the second time. But, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no connection there, buddy. <laughs> so... Uh, I said, it might add five pounds. Uh, that means I could probably bench press 10, maybe 15 pounds, you know, with the bench shirt. <laughs> so, but I, they swear by them, you know, uh, bench shirt. Did you probably have worn bench shirts? Uh, I'm the only help thing I'll use is knee wraps and uh, wrist straps. I'm not into all of those gimmicks. Yeah, I mean, I see. I was not, I come way before the gimmicks did, man. So we didn't have. All we had was those six-inch uh, ace bandages. That after you wrap them like two or three times, the elasticity was already gone out of them. And of course, we'd use them for like five months. <laughs> so you really didn't get much help out of them. And uh, I used straps, you know, for poles. And uh, chin-ups, uh, that was about it. You know, and a belt, of course. You know, we uh, had just a, a standard uh, four-inch wide uh, piece of leather for our uh, Olympic belt. But, uh, you know, in, in Olympic lifting, the type of lifting I did, you know, the, the overhead lift, you couldn't uh, use tape on your fingers. Let, let, let's say you tore all these calluses off your hand, which I've done a half a dozen times. I know people, some lifters have had so much damage done to their hands from tear, tearing those calluses off that they, they, they weren't able to lift anymore. And because the rules were you couldn't tape your hands. You know, unless you really had a severe injury. Well, that was up to the judge. You know, the weightlifting judge, not the municipal judge down at the courthouse. But, uh, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And this is just kind of a personal question for my own knowledge. Uh, for deadlifting, like let's say I want to get my deadlift up. 
how many sets and reps would you recommend uh, for a typical deadlift workout and how many times a week would, would you do them? Well, for deadlifting, that's a lot of stress on the lower back and, uh, you know, uh, uh, hips and uh, everything, but mainly the lower back. I would, I wouldn't do heavy deadlifts on any kind of consistent basis. I would do hyperextensions. I would do good mornings. I do high poles. And, you know, uh, assistant uh, exercises like that would prepare your uh, lower back directly and uh, indirectly in order to strengthen that uh, uh, part of the body to get used to uh, uh, deadlifting. If you, if, uh, let's say you're six weeks out, eight weeks out from a, a competition, and uh, you really want to do a, a number on the weight, weight lift. You want to set a personal record, let's say. I, I do uh, one light day and one heavy day. And the most reps I would do, uh, let's say uh, you do a sequence of, uh, let's say you warm up with 315 pounds. You do a set of five. Then you go to uh, 365, do another set of five. Then you go, uh, uh, what, what's the next jump there, 415? Do a set of three. Then go to 465, do another set of three. And then start going down, sets of two, sets of one, maybe three sets of one until you, you know, bottom out or top out on your uh, deadlift. But that would be a maximum workout once a week. Because otherwise, your lower back gets so damn fatigued because you're doing back squats. And uh, let's say if, if you're doing hyperextensions, good mornings, that's a lot of stress in that lower back. And, you know, everybody in the world has a bad back. I could testify that I've had a bad back since I was born. I was born with two incomplete vertebrae in my lower back, the fourth and fifth lumbar. And nobody could tell me why my fucking back bothered me all the time until I was 10 years old. <clears throat> and uh, I fell off a 35-foot uh, cliff up at a, at a sand and gravel pit a couple miles from uh, I, where I grew up, at, uh, from my parents' house. So. Uh, my mom takes me up to the hospital and the doctor x-rays my lower back because they thought that I might have hurt my back. Now, I wasn't complaining about my back. I was complaining about my damn wrist. I broke my wrist. <laughs> but anyway, the x-rays come back. My fourth and fifth lumbar have a hairline fracture in them. And the doctor wasn't sure if that was a break or an incomplete fusion of my fourth and fifth lumbar when I was born. Because you know, back in those days, yeah, I'm talking you know, about that, that's back in the 1800s, you know, we still had buckboard uh, and covered wagons and whatnot. And uh, used to drink water out of a canteen, not out of a plastic bottle. So uh, uh, when we uh, finally uh, found out I was I was 19, and the technology and X-ray had come along enough where the doctors could determine that I was born uh, with those incomplete vertebrae, that it wasn't a fracture. So that's a long, eh. but yeah, well, I've had a fucked up back my whole life. It pisses me off. <laughs> I'm sure. I drink too much. I'm sure wrestling didn't help either. Now, you also feuded with Bob Backlund, who is – I've met him a bunch of times. He's He seems to be kind of like his heel character in real life. He seems like he could almost be like a, a ticking time bomb. But maybe it was just around me. But uh, what did you think of him as a wrestler and being around him outside the ring? 
Well, Bob and I have been friends for Jesus, well, 35, you know, 55 years. Jeez, I'm getting pissed off now. 55 years. You hear that, Nick? God. <laughs> Sounds like I'm pissed off because I'm getting old. Well, if that's true. No, Bobby, you know, he kind of has a personality that's a little unhinged at times. But he doesn't mean anything by it, trust me. But uh, a, a lot of people, and, and that's why I think that maybe you might have mistaken that uh, uh, the wrong way. But uh, I wouldn't want to fight Bob because he is a little unhinged. You get it? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I do like him, though. Like, I don't get me wrong by that. He just seems like if you rub him the wrong way or do something to offend him, that there could be a big explosion real fast. Yeah. <laughs> could be. <laughs> I'm not going to say it couldn't happen, but uh, I think the odds are that it won't happen. But at his age, at my age, I would take him on. <laughs> There's yeah, well, Bob is what seventy three. He's getting up there. I know he takes uh, CBD now, which I was surprised. Yeah. I saw a news story on him. Yeah, taking that. Uh, do you ever take any of that stuff? Or uh... as a matter of fact, I do, and the reason I do is because my my daughter uh, uh, sells CBD oil, and she makes. Uh, uh, a rubbing compound, a balm uh, with CBD, and she puts a little more in it than uh, what's recommended by the uh, uh, health food stores or whoever regulates that. I, I, I never did ask her who re regulates that, but she has returned customers up the wazoo. I, I, it's, it's unbelievable. She started this about four or five years ago. Uh, practicing doing the mixing, the the quantity and the quality of uh, her product, and she grows her own cannabis, and then she sells it to a company uh, down in the Twin Cities, and uh, the way she pays for it, they take fifty percent of the product and give her. Uh, the other 50%. And so it doesn't cost her anything other than uh, a good plot of land and some water. And uh, well, she, she works her ass off. But she convinced me to take it. I said, eh, Natalie, I said, it's a bunch of bullshit, you know, goddamn marijuana plant. What the hell's that going to do for me? The stuff works. I couldn't believe it. I rubbed that crap on, you know, my. My hands are all busted up, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm not real arthritic yet, but I feel it coming. And when I use that CBD uh, bomb, um, that ointment that she makes, I rub that on there. And the reason I rub it on because it's free for me. <laughs> but uh, I checked her prices. I went on the internet. She, her prices are lower. And uh, her product is better. And uh, that that's what I like about it. Now, I didn't ask you in the last interview about Ole Anderson. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? Ole? Yes. Oh, Ole's a bad man. Can I say uh, the N-word? Sure. I'll bleep it out. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Ole, you know, we wrestled down there in North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, yeah, you know, back in the old days, yeah, you know, 50 years ago almost. And uh we were having a discussion in the locker room one day. And Ernie Ladd was uh uh doing the booking 
And uh, for those that don't know what a booker does, a booker puts together the matches and tells the guys uh, who they're wrestling and uh, how the finish is going to go and whatnot. And it, in other words, he, he's controlling the locker room. Well, Ole loved doing that stuff. And uh, he got pissed off, off at Ernie Ladd one day. Now, here's Ole 5'10", and here's Ernie Ladd 6'10". So Ole's looking up at Ernie and says, You fucking... You, you don't even know how to put matches together. What the hell's going on here? And Ernie looks at him. What are you talking about? This is a better program than you ever put together. So Ole said, you dumb fucking You think you can do this because you graduated from Grambling College? Anybody can graduate from Grambling College because it's a college. <laughs> I said, Jesus. I said, Ole, slow down here. But Ernie was laughing right along with everybody else in the locker room. You know, back in the 70s, that didn't bother white people. It didn't bother black people. You know, now it's a big deal. So, uh, oh, and I'll tell you another guy. It has to do with Ernie Ladd again. Killer Carl Cox was a white guy from Maryland, uh, just outside of Baltimore. And I met uh, Carl, his, uh, uh, God, what was his, uh, Herbie, his real name was Herbie something. God bless him, he passed away. Ernie's passed away. Fuck, everybody's gone. Um, anyway, um, when we were down working for Bill Watts and Leroy McGurk down in Louisiana territory, uh, Ernie uh, was, uh, he'd come in for like two, three months at a time. Cause he, he grew up and he was living over in uh, uh, the new Orleans area over in Louisiana. And so killer Carl Cox, he tells Ernie now Kill killers like 15 years older than me. And I'm 77 now, so he'd be in his 80s. So anyway, he was still in his 40s back in those days. God damn it, Ernie, what the fuck are you thinking about? And Ernie would look at him, well, what the fuck are you thinking about? Well, we got to do it this way, we got to do it that way. And he says, you graduated from that goddamn grambling and uh, he says anybody could graduate from that school and Ernie says oh yeah why because that's a school oh Jesus I said this sounds like uh, Ole Anderson talking but it was that's how people thought back in those days now that, that these are, things are several years removed like three four years apart but they're basically using the same language, the same terms, uh, the same mentality of uh, of that era. And uh, but yeah, Andre the Giant uh, used that, those terms as well, didn't he? Here and there, I heard the what? Uh, didn't Andre the Giant use those terms as well? Uh, oh yeah. Here and there, uh, yeah. Yeah, why not? You know, everybody did. It wasn't this big boogaloo that they have going now. This is just a liberal bullshit to get everybody fighting each other. That's all it is. I, when I was a kid growing up in Portland, Oregon, back in the fifties and sixties, all the black kids in the neighborhood would call each other. The white kids never called them. I never called anybody. You know, back you know in the playground or out in the street, but uh, nowadays, oh my God, such a sensitive word. You know, that that meanie, he hurt my feelings. Well, the black the black kids called each other. They still do. It's it's not a 
you know, bone of dissension or anything like that. It's just that's, I guess it's a, a badge of honor now for a black kid to call another black kid a I guess that's what it is. That's what I've heard anyway. And for Andre the Giant, uh, how was your appetite compared to his? I'm sure you ate with him a couple of times. And what was it like drinking with him? I'll tell you. I'll tell you a quick story. We go to the Ori House. It's owned by a Korean lady. It's two blocks down from the hotel that we stayed at in New York City. And uh, so uh, Andre asked me if I was going to have dinner that night. I said, yeah, I think I'd go somewhere. Why don't you come down to the Ori house? I said, well, yeah, the, the one just a couple blocks south of here. Yeah. He said, uh, Lou, Lou Albano and Freddie Blassie and Dino Bravo, Pat Patterson. Yeah, but, you know, I, I think Mr. Fuji and Don Rock over there too. So we all go down there. There's like 12 of us. And it's a real small place. You know, it's not a huge place. But the food's fantastic. It's all Korean barbecue type. And uh, she always got the best cuts of meat coming into New York City. I don't know how she did it. I think it was a little uh, money under the table type thing. And the booze. Oh, my God. You order a drink in there. It was like ordering a double or a triple anywhere else. But, you know, for the same price as a single. This Korean lady loved Andre the Giant. Couldn't do enough for him. So after about five hours, that was a long. We got down there about 9 o'clock at night. And we left at 2 in the morning. So I, Andre gets up, goes to the bathroom, takes a piss. When he's gone, I tell everybody. I said, everybody chip in 100 uh, to help Andre out with this tab. That would have been, uh, you know, like eleven, twelve hundred dollars Because Andre was notorious for picking up the tab. When I was with Andre, just him and I, he would never let me pay for anything. Never. And I said, Jesus, how am I going to get this guy? So I'm going to get him this night. He comes back. And I got all this money. I go up to give it to the lady, the Korean lady that owns the Ori house. What's that for, Ken? I said, to help out with the bill. No, 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 no. The bill's taken care of. <laughs> what? The bill's taken care of. Oh, I said, this son of a bitch got me again. I said, how? <laughs> I couldn't pay for anything when he was around. But uh, that, that was... Uh, I think he ate eight steaks uh, because I ate six. So I know he ate eight. And these were like, you know, six, seven ounce steaks, Korean barbecue style. Oh, God, they just melt in your mouth. And so that'd be uh, eight steaks. That, that'd be like, you know, four or five pounds, which, you know, that's just a snack for a guy that size. Seven four four hundred fifty pounds. I think at that time he might have been five hundred pounds. You never know. He's a big man. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Bill Kazmaier, who did the World's Strongest Man competitions, and also he tried wrestling for WCW for a while and in Stampede, but I believe he was ribbed and and tormented a little bit in wrestling, so he never stuck with it. Do you know who got him into wrestling? You? Me. <laughs> I swear to God. And uh, uh, Bill Kazmaier and uh, uh, Ted Arcidi. I got both of those guys into the WWF. They both wind up, up uh, in my, or, uh, Calgary working for Stampede Wrestling, run by none other than Stu Hart. You know, one of the most sadistic bastards that ever came along. He'd get, 
he get those guys down in the dungeon. That's his basement in his house. He's got this monster house. And, uh, you know, he'd take liberties with all these guys. Uh, you want to be a wrestler, huh? Uh, you ever wrestle before? Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you a few tricks. Let's go down the basement. Down they go. <laughs> Most people didn't come out of that basement feeling too good. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I got uh, Kaz Meyer and uh, Ted Arcidi. And, uh, uh, right, and these are the two strongest guys in the United States at the time. So you have to picture that. And here I, I, I was in the WWF, you know. I wasn't in that territory at the time. I moved on to the AWA back to Minnesota. So Vince McMahon's dealing with them. And, uh, uh, oh, so anyway, Kazmaier still wants to do, you know, the strongman contest. I think he had already won it three times, didn't he? Yeah. 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 Four. He holds the record, I think, or he did for a long time for most. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And then Ted, I don't know, you know, Ted, uh, he was into nutrition products and whatnot. And so he had a real good, uh, you know, uh, protein powders and vitamins and all that stuff. And uh, so that that was really interesting. They're, they're good guys. Bill Kazmaier, Ted Arcidi, you know, salt of the earth type guys. You know, have you ever met either one of them? No, I don't even know what they're doing these days. Uh... I know Bill Kazmaier kind of travels around the world. Uh, I haven't heard from Ted in years, but I'd like to track him down. I saw Ted over in, uh, well, not too far from here, down across the street from LaGuardia Airport in Queens there. I saw him down there in an autograph session about four, maybe five years ago, maybe six years ago. And... Uh, I was walking down the hallway and this kid comes up to me, you know, about 20 years old. He says, Ken, you know, Ted Arcidi. I said, yeah, of course. He said, he, he's in the room down here on the left. He wants to see you. I said, really? I said, I haven't seen Ted in shit 20 years. So anyway, I had a bad habit of Copenhagen. Just a pinch between the <laughs> gum and lip, you know. You know how it goes. Yeah, so, a lot of a lot of wrestlers like that stuff, especially oh, from your yeah. Get you fired up. <laughs> I got this habit from my grandfather, John Nord. And I bumped into the berserker one day about 40 years ago, John Nord from Minnesota. I looked, I'm looking up at him because he's a big guy, you know, he's six five, six, six. I go up to him and say, Hey, do you think you're the real John Nord? And he's looking down at me. Oh, who's this old prick? I said, My grandpa, John Nord from Norway, was the real John Nord. And then he starts getting that. he says, Oh, really? Why is your name Patera then? <laughs> I said because his daughter married my father and my father's name was Patera he said okay I get it now <laughs> the berserker you remember the berserker yes you've aged a lot better than he has he's uh, oh. been in a lot of legal trouble which I'm not sure if you know about or not oh uh, uh, yeah Oh, I'm a well, 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 we're, I have a friend in Minnesota that kind of knows John Nord and kind of follows some of the bullshit that he's been through, you know. That, drugs, I have no use for drugs. I mean, they just do, they destroy people. And John's been on and off of uh, uh, all kinds of drugs, I, I guess, since he was a teenager. You know, he went to school with all those guys, you know, Kurt Henning and the Road Warriors and uh, Rick Rude. Yeah, so all those guys are the same age. And they, uh, 
another one, uh, Norton. Uh, you, you, you know Norton, the, yeah. the arm wrestler? I, I do, yeah. Great guy. Oh, what a moose. And all those guys, they all went to school together. And some of them turned out all right, and some of them didn't turn out. You know, the ones that didn't turn out all right went to the grave, you know, when they were in their 40s. And, uh, Maybe you know the answer to this before I forget to ask you uh, from your Minnesota connections. Have you heard the uh, the rumor that Rick Rude actually killed himself because supposedly he tried to use some type of injectable, not Viagra, but some type of injectable performance enhancer in his dick, and then something went wrong, and he ended up having to kill himself, I guess, because he was so depressed over it. I don't know yeah. if that's true or not, but. That's true. And I'll tell you, very few people would admit this. I heard about it two days after they found him dead on the floor. I heard from, about it from um, um, Jim Neidhart. Because Jim Neidhart and Rick Rube were real close friends. And I think at that time, Neidhart was living down there in Florida. I, I think they lived real close together. And uh, he said, uh, Rick just lost his fucking mind because they had he had to go to the hospital and they're gonna amputate his penis. Well, his penis was the most dearest thing to him. And uh, so to my knowledge, that's a true story. You know, not very many people are brave enough to mention that. You and one other person, I can't remember the other person mentioned that to me like 15 years ago. Well, I've had some credible people also tell me that. That's the only reason I, I bring it up uh, okay. because I know you were from the area. Yeah. Now, I know you must have had some uh, contact with Bruce Wilhelm over the years. Uh, do you have any stories about him? I just talked to him on Wednesday. Yeah, <laughs> he calls me up. I don't answer the phone all the time. So he leaves this message. So I'm looking at my message. Oh, Bruce called about an hour ago. So I punch it in. Patera, you fucking asshole. Where's your phone? Stuck up your ass again? God damn it. Answer the phone, will you? <laughs> I said, Jesus Christ. I said, I better call Bruce back. He's pissed off. So I call him and I said, now what's up? He said, nothing. I said, you were ranting and raving. For two minutes on my goddamn answering machine about shit. He's, yeah, just shit. <laughs> have you had uh, have you had dinner yet, or are you guys going out to eat after this? We're, we're in there. It should be about oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I was expecting to go to a big old steakhouse and get steak and lobster, buddy. Yeah. Try order McDonald's. Or shrimp pond. What the fuck is shrimp pond? Oh, Parmesan. Goddamn I'm Italian. After hearing you talk about steak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love steak. I grew up on steak. Yeah. So for Bruce Wil Wilhelm, did you have anything to do, you or Bruce, with getting uh, Crusher Blackwell into the World's Strongest Man competition? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I... Uh... Crusher Blackwell and I were tag team partners. And, you know, Jerry would always tell me about these stories about growing up in the city, but his uncle had a farm. He'd go out on the farm, you know, when he was 10, 12 years old. And everybody was amazed at how strong the kid was. And that continued into his late teenage years and then early 20s. So uh, I said, well, Jerry, did you ever lift any barbells? No, didn't, didn't believe in it. You know, he's a typical Southern boy. You know, Jerry couldn't read or write. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he couldn't read or write, but God, he's sharp as a tack. You know, re really a bright guy. And uh, so anyway, 
he had me convinced, and I had him talk to Bruce because Bruce was still associated with the World Strongest Men contest, and that uh, Bruce uh, used to come up to Minnesota a couple times a year to visit. You know, so I introduced him to Jerry and. Um, uh, Bruce Wilhelm, he knew superstar Billy Graham real well from the Arizona days when they used to train at a gym out there. Did you ever train at that gym? No, not yet. Yeah. I don't think it's around anymore. It might not be. Yeah, we're talking, it would be going on like 50 years now. Yeah. But anyway... Uh, so Bruce says, yeah, hell, we'll get him in. So, uh, we got, uh, Jerry all straightened out for the world's strongest men contest. He's going to do phenomenal. He didn't do shit. He couldn't do anything. And, uh, well, I, I should say that he did a little bit, but it was kind of an embarrassment. It wasn't as big an uh, embarrassment as uh, Ivan Putsky, though. Did you see Ivan Putsky? I remember it now, but I would have been very young at the time when I was watching those replays. Uh, I didn't even – it's only coming back to me now that he did. Yeah. Yeah, I was the first one because I was legitimate, but I was wrestling every fucking night on the road, driving 400 miles a day. And I didn't have time to train, you know, to, and I, I had, and this is 1977. I hadn't lifted heavy weights since 1972. And so uh, I was the first one. And then uh, uh, Jerry Blackwell, Putsky, and then superstar Billy Graham did the World's Strongest Men Contest in 1980. And, uh, uh, Billy, uh, Billy did a couple of events pretty good, but you know, shit, we're all moving up in age. You know, we don't have time to lift all those heavy barbells to get ready for something like that. So, yeah, and he was on the road too. It's not like now where yeah. they train full time for that. And yeah, I don't, I don't think you even had sponsors, did you? No, we didn't even know what a sponsor was. <laughs> And, uh, you know, Vince McMahon, he would encourage me to, to, I told him that I had a chance to do something that's brand new. It's never been done before. A good friend of mine, Harold Conley, uh, won the gold medal in the 1956 Olympic Games in the hammer throw down in Melbourne, uh, Australia. And uh, he wants me to compete in the first inaugural event out uh, uh, Universal Cities or Universal Studios uh, in uh, Culver City or no Ho North Hollywood, North Hollywood, California, and uh, so Vince says, "Yeah, go for it." You know, uh, can't really give you any time off. You know, now those fucking wrestling pro promoters give you could give you any time off. Well, shit. I, I had hurt my back wrestling Bobby Backlund in uh, the Boston Garden, and uh, just uh, just a, one of those nagging, stupid little injuries. You know, I took a bump over the top rope, caught my hip on the apron, on the ring apron, and just jackknifed myself. Oh man, I couldn't stand up straight for a month. And here, the next thing I know, I'm out there trying to do squats and. Uh, pick up cars and press beer barrels over my head all the I, every time I'm doing that I said what the fuck am I doing this shit for you know it's not benefiting me uh, so, so I won like fifty three hundred dollars well th then I had to take time off from wrestling and I lost twenty thousand because I couldn't wrestle my back was so bad but anyway, that was uh, those were the days, my friend, when you were young and dumb and full of cum. Didn't know, didn't know any better. <laughs> you mentioned the Boston Garden. I've had a lot of wrestlers say, as a heel, that was a dangerous place to work for 
for fan attacks. Did you find that as well? Absolutely. Anything in uh, New England. Uh, the worst arena. was over in Springfield, the beautiful capital of Massachusetts, because the arena there, they put down like 800, maybe 1,000 seats on the floor. And they had a bar set up in the back, those eight-foot tables, picnic tables, and about five or six of those lined up, packed with booze. Well, who was the clientele? Bunch of Puerto Ricans. You get those Puerto Ricans all crazed out on booze, and you know they're popping pills and everything else. And next thing you know, you got 10 or 12 of them jumping on your head, uh, going to the ring, and twice as many going back to the locker room from the ring. The cops were fantastic, though. The cops always told me, you know, before we even go out, they knew every hoodlum in town. Well, we got this group. We got that group. We're going to have to watch this, watch that. There'd be four cops on either side of me going to the ring and coming out of the ring. People ask me what my tough, who was my toughest opponent? I said, the goddamn Puerto Ricans from Springfield, Massachusetts. <laughs> And I said, what? Well, yeah. And I said, you want to know the second toughest opponent? Yeah. It was that fucking asphalt highway underneath my car. We're driving an average of 350 miles to a match, an average of 350 miles back from a match. So now you got 700 miles every day. So what are you going to do? What are the chances of going off the road, having some kind of an accident, you know, getting run over by an 18-wheeler? And uh, thank God I was always well aware of what uh, the pitfalls would be. And uh, a lot of guys didn't pay attention. They got killed or seriously injured. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think when WWE brought you back in the late 80s that they should have made you a heel because you seem to be a much more natural heel? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. That was my decision. Because if I had got, after uh, doing that little stint in uh, Wuhan uh, Penitentiary in Wisconsin, the judge was a real mother. He told me if I got into any trouble that he'd slam me back in jail for a minimum of two years. I So I talked to my attorney. I said, can he do that? Yeah. Yeah, he can do that. I said, that son of a bitch. So I told Vince, I said, if I get out, if, I, uh, if I'm going into an arena and some asshole jumps on me or four or five of them jump on me, I beat the piss out of them, they can file charges against me. I have no rights. That's uh, the law in the United States of America. You know, once you have a felony conviction, uh, you're a piece of shit. And I wound up being a piece of shit. So... I told Vince, I said, to prevent me going back to uh, prison, uh, I'll be a good guy. I'll be uh, a baby face from now on. He says, you want it that way? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. He says, well, you'd be better off being a heel. I said, I know. I know. I want to be a heel, but I can't. My hands are tight. I have no choice. So that's, that's the skinny on that. You against Hogan would have been uh, very financially uh, good for you. Uh, did you have much co like connection with Hogan behind the scenes? Yeah, yeah. I uh, when I went back to Minnesota in '82, uh, Hulk had been there for five six months, 
and he was the top baby face. So I come in as a heel. Well, this is before the run in with the cops. We sold out everywhere. I, I worked with Hulk four or five times a week for two, three months. And uh, we wrestled each other so often for high spots. He, uh, him and I developed a number system. Let's say uh, one was a turnbuckle, two was a reverse turnbuckle, three was a, a backdrop, four was a body slam, five was a you know a beal or what whatever, and so our matches were one to ten, and then we go home do the finish. <laughs> it was hilarious, yeah, because we were every night. So yeah, why, why change anything that? Don't change it if it's working. Yeah. And there was no internet back then, so no one would have had any way of. No, we used to wrestle over in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and place in little towns that were only sixty miles apart. And you know, let's say you have fifteen hundred, two thousand people in those high schools, uh, uh, gymnasiums, and there might might only be two or three people from uh, the other town that saw the match the week before. So, you know, hell, we didn't change nothing. <laughs> when you did that little stint, did you have problems working out when you were in there or were you still able to lift and eat pretty decently? Oh, I, I ate uh, as well as I had ever eaten and I uh, lifted as much as I wanted. Uh, I was a hero. Uh, especially with the black inmates, because they all hated the cops. And then I find out about a month later, the prison guards hated the cops just as bad as the black inmates. Because, you know, when you're in a small community there, everybody knows each other. And uh, the cops hated the uh, prison guards, and the prison guards hated the cops, and the Inmates, uh, the especially the blacks. I mean, the white white inmates hated the cops too, and vice versa. But uh, uh, most of the inmates uh, were black, and most of the inmates, being black, were from Milwaukee, Chicago, all those areas. You know, the big city uh, gangster mentality. They loved me. I was their hero. Yeah. So you never ran into any problems? No, because my offense was against 16 cops. That's why. my I, I was an anti-authoritarian bad guy that they loved. You know, I, 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 I get in a ruckus with 16 cops, beat the piss out of all of them, go to prison, then Ken Patera, Jesus. You know, you know, being in the Olympics and uh, Pan American Games, the strongman contests, all that shit. You know, the, I'll tell you, inmates have the best knowledge of professional wrestling or any sport. That's all they have to do. You know, they can't leave. You know, there's bars on the windows and doors. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Now, did you ever run across the Ultimate Warrior uh, during your WWF run? Oh, yeah. Uh, the way I met Jimmy Helwig, he was going to chiropractic school down in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, one day I was over at my friend's gym, John Coffey, called uh, Coffey's Gym. He just passed away from Alzheimer's not too long ago. He grew up in a very, very wealthy family. I mean, they had butlers, they had chauffeurs, you know, they had everything. Very wealthy family. Well, you look at John, you wouldn't know that he had two pennies to rub together, you know, and uh, really a sweetheart of a guy. So anyway, um, I'm down there working out at Coffee's Gym. There's two big guys come in. Well, one was Bill Kazmaier, and he was friends with uh, Jim Helwig, Ultimate Warrior. 
And uh, Helwig had two Snickers bars tucked into his waistband. He had a pair of Bermuda shorts on. I'm looking at that. I says, you like Snickers, do you? <laughs> and uh, that was the first time I had met him. You know, real personal guy, you know, nice guy. And uh, he told me that he was thinking, you know, he knew all about me and everything. And he was thinking about going to Dallas, uh, Texas, and uh, becoming a pro wrestler. I said, well, what are you doing now? He said, well, I'm going to chiropractic school. I said, well, why don't you just stay in school, get your degree, and if you're not happy with the profession, then try wrestling. Well, that's what he did. So, uh, yeah, he was a good guy. I like Jimmy. Yeah. I always called him Jimmy. I, everybody called him Ultimate Warrior, but, you know, when I, I, I knew him as Jimmy Hellwig. Yeah. I'm surprised he uh, ate Snickers with how lean he was, but I guess maybe in those days he wasn't as lean. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you what year that would have that would that would have been 1980. Okay. Yeah, that would have been uh, no, 81. That would have been 1981 uh, when that would have been. Yeah, because that's when I met uh, Bill Kazmaier too. Is it true you uh, amateur wrestled Chris Taylor at one point? Well, not actually wrestling, but we were uh, uh, both the in Munich, Germany for the 72 Olympic Games, me as a weightlifter and Chris as a, a Greco-Roman wrestler. Well, here, at that time, Chris weighed like 370 or 380, but he didn't have anybody to work out with. You know, uh, Olympic wrestling was all weight classes. What's he going to do, go wrestle uh, somebody that weighed 123 pounds? I don't think so. So he comes over to the dormitory, uh, uh, my dor dormitory where the weightlifters were staying, and he says, Ken, I hate to ask you, I, I need a favor. And he tells me this. He says, I don't have anybody to pummel with, you know, and, uh, you know, get pushed around and, uh, you know, kind of manhandle. And at that time, I weighed like 340. He was you know, 380, 370. And he said, God, you'd really be doing me a great uh, service if, if you could do that for me. And uh, I says, Chris, I think we can arrange that. And Vern Gagne was over in Munich at the time, and everybody knew I was going to go wrestle for Vern Gagne as soon as I got out of the Olympics. And then Chris had a guarantee with Ganya, so when, but he wanted to go one more time for the world uh, wrestling championships. So I went over to the wrestling hall, oh, three or four times with Chris and did the pummel, uh, pummeling exercise and the pushing, and because it's all Greco Roman, all upper body. He loved it. He said those were the best workouts he ever had. <laughs> I said, really? He says, really? This is like a year or two later he told me this. Uh, we want, Yeah, we wound up being tag team partners in the AWA. Uh, we were called the Olympians. And, uh, yeah, so that, that it worked out good for him. And I enjoyed it, you know. He said, Jesus Christ, Ken, you're so strong. He said, you, you're the one that ought to be doing this Greco-Roman wrestling. I said, Chris, you, you're the wrestler. I'm the weightlifter. How's that? Ah, okay. <laughs> Who do you I think? Know, that is it. We kept in this beautiful resort, and I heard that there's a Canadian that's trying to take the captain's credit and trying to get everything changed. They moved me to a different hotel. This is absurd. What? This has something to do with you, Hannibal. I know it. This is the last you'll see of me until I come up to Toronto. And well, I'm you better bring Ken back on because I know the fans are going to want a part three. If you're lucky, right. Hannibal, I'm going to see you face-to-face -face in Toronto, and I've got a lot of things on my mind. So you better watch out. You better watch out. He'll put the full Nelson on you if you don't learn some manners. Right. And I'll put the full Nelson on you, Hannibal. 
Well, before I shut this down, I just want to say Billy Graham watched your last interview too, and he said you look great, and uh, he was happy to see you're still as sharp as ever and as muscular as ever. Muscular? I better leave my shirt on. <laughs> All your traps, your traps, and your oh, uh, yeah, the, thickness. The traps and calves will always be there. <laughs> well, since the captain's kicking us out, I'll make this last question simple. Who would win in a shoot if Vern Ganya had had a shoot uh, wrestling match with Stu Hart? Oh, boy. You know, I actually think they did wrestle at one time, you know, back in the 50s. Uh, you know, they were both professionals, but back in those days, those guys were so headstrong with the amateur stuff that they did wrestle. I know they wrestled, yeah, you know, for real. And uh, I don't, I don't remember who won. I think Stu Hart might have beat him. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm not. God, I wish. Uh, um, what, what's Stu's uh, boy's name? Uh, Brett, Bruce, Ross, Wayne, uh, they've Owen. Yeah, well, Owen passed away. God, what, what an ugly. I saw that. Ah, what was that around 98, 99, something like yeah, that? 90, yeah, I think 98, I think. Yeah. You know, I didn't even watch wrestling at that time. I just happened to turn the TV on that Saturday and boom. I said, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that was ugly. Well, we hope to have you back on for a part three down the road. Uh, yeah, we'll do it. Great. Is there any? I'll let you. Uh, I'll let you close this off this time because I know the captain's kicking us out. I'll let you say whatever you want to say to close this off for the fans. Well, yeah, you know, I had never heard of Hannibal the animal uh, prior to uh, what was it, three, four weeks ago, and then I. I started talking to my old buddies like Ric Flair and I mean, a, a handful of others. They said, God, but, I mean, you have a hell of a fell following. I wasn't aware. And I says, well, that's what I get for being stuck in a snowbank in St. Paul, Minnesota for the past 20, 30 years. And uh, I, I said, I ought to get out more often. And, uh, but I've, I've, Really enjoyed this. It's nice to know that Billy Graham and Ric Flair and so, uh, so many uh, of my old friends from way back when, you know, we're, we're getting up there in age. There are not too many of us around anymore. And uh, so it, it's nice to hear from them. And it's nice to meet young guys like yourself. What are you, about 22, 23? I, I wish I could say that, but I'm 38. Oh. You fucking asshole, Captain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, have a great uh, holiday season because I'm sure I won't talk to you until next year. Okay. You too. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.